What is up? And welcome to part three of the Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silver's first annual NBA season preview. I am your host, Brandon Silvers. If you haven't seen or heard the first two parts, I cover the championship contenders, the playoff contenders. I let you know what you need to know, whether you're a diehard NBA fan, a casual, or have no clue what the NBA is. In this part, we are covering the teams who aren't going to win a damn thing except maybe the draft lottery. I'm going to let you know why they're bad and being the optimist that I am. If we can find the slightest glimmer of hope, I'm going to let you know about that as well. Also, I'll talk about exactly what you can expect from each team this season. So if your team is in this part, I'm sorry, but let's go ahead and get started. Okay, first up, we've got the New York Knicks. Bing bong. Well, it was fun while it lasted, but last season you went 37 and 45. Julius Randle led a bad 2021 playoff carry over into all of last season. Now, I have a hard time criticizing Julius because he set the pick that got Kobe open for the game winner in his last game, but he was bad on the court and off the court as well, arguing with anybody and everybody. They probably have to hope he bounces back this season so he can raise his value up so they can trade him. So when that's your hope for your best player, really hard to be a good team. Then on top of all that, when was the last time the organization or his fans had a level-headed opinion on anything? They always think they're in the running for some big-time free agent because of the time it happened, um, never. Now what's sad is a Knicks fan listening to this just yelled out, what about Amari? Further proving my point about their level-headedness. But yeah, free agents want to come here so bad that they had to overpay for Jalen Brunson and hire his dad. But we can't forget about the main reason they stink. That's right, their owner is James Dolan. But hey, even with all that, there's got to be some hope, right? So let's take a look at it. Just kidding. There is none here. Like I said, their owner is James Dolan. They will continue to be no better than mediocre as long as that's the case. The league is more fun when the Knicks are good, but those moments have been few and far between. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about and further illustrate my point how New York overrates everything, I always talk about how Derek Jeter would be a nobody if he played for a smaller market team like the Kansas City Royals. The Knicks are the perfect example of that. Since 1985, go look at what the Knicks have done and go look at what the Utah Jazz have done and tell me which franchise is more successful. Anyways, I don't have to tell Knicks fans why there's hope because they always seem to have it even when they shouldn't because they love to be disappointed. These are not people who want to be happy. That's why they're Knicks fans. All right, so what does all this mean for this season? Well, Vegas has set the over-under at 38 and a half wins, which feels pretty spot on because that's just enough games to give their fans hope while also letting them be disappointed at the end of the day. Congratulations. All right, the next terrible team we're going to talk about is the Indiana Pacers. They were 25 and 57 last year. Why are they going to be terrible again? Okay, be honest. How many Pacers can you name off the top of your head? Exactly. Now go ahead and Google them and you'll see their best players would actually be the third or fourth best player on a team that's actually good. So they don't have the talent to trade for any real help. They haven't drafted and developed a true superstar since Paul George. And guess what? Free agents don't want to come here. Okay, so is there any hope? Well, Tyrese Halliburton and Buddy Heald both looked good after coming over from the Kings. Rick Carlisle is a fantastic coach who's going to help them figure out if any of their young talent is worth developing. And their 90s throwback jerseys are way cooler than any jersey with that much yellow should be. Okay, so what does this season look like? Well, Vegas has set their over-under at 23 and a half wins, which actually feels a little bit low to me. I think Rick Carlisle is going to get Halliburton to continue to develop. He's a really good young player, like I was saying. I don't think they break the 30-win mark, though. They're certainly in full rebuild mode. This is one of those rosters that I look at and think I could get a 10-day. Congratulations to the Washington Wizards. You're up next, 35 and 47 last season. Why are you so terrible? Okay, well, believe it or not, there was a time probably around the 2017-2018 season when you'd be excited about a team that had Bradley Beal, Kristaps Porzingis, and Kyle Kuzma. Unfortunately, it's 2022, and while Kristaps and Bradley can still give you 30 points a game each, they also might only play 30 games a season. Porzingis catches knee injuries like Beal catches COVID. I'm dead serious. Beal has caught COVID like a million times. And Kyle Kuzma dresses like an asshole. But that was the case in 2017, 2018, too, so I don't know. And then on top of all that, they used their first round pick on a guy who played for Wisconsin. If you've watched Wisconsin play, you know there's just nothing there. So I don't have high hopes for him. They probably should have just drafted Kuzma a stylist. Okay, but is there any actual hope, though? Well, I cannot stress this enough. 
Kuzma still dresses terribly, but he did play a lot better without the distractions and pressure that come with playing for the Lakers. Also, if Beal and Porzingis are healthy, that's a hell of a one-two punch. And maybe Corey Kispert develops into this generation's Dan Marley. You really never know. Just kidding. None of those things are going to happen without the help of an actual Harry Potter-ass wizard. Vegas is expecting more of the same, setting the over-under at 35 and a half games for the Wizards, also works as an over-under for the number of games Beal and Porzingis play together. I'm going under on both, low 30s at best. Next up, we have the Charlotte Hornets. They actually weren't terrible last year. They went 43 and 39, but they lost again in the play-in tourney and they got blown out. They just were completely unprepared. So why are they going to stink this year? Okay, the past two seasons have been like Groundhog Day for them, where they're this fun, young, energetic team throughout the regular season. They make the play-in where they show up completely unprepared and get blown out. They fired James Borrego after this happened again and brought back Steve Clifford, who stunk the first time he was here. And then the big story for them this offseason was star forward Miles Bridges, who was arrested for felony domestic violence. Hard to believe he's going to play it all this season, if ever again, which is fine because it really feels pointless to talk about him as a basketball player with all this going on. Hopefully justice is served and everyone involved can get the help that they need. Okay, so as we awkwardly transition to basketball, you want to either be competing for a championship in the NBA or so bad that you're competing for the top pick so you can draft a potential superstar. The Hornets have been stuck in this terrible purgatory where they do neither and that has to end. So unless every other team falls off the face of the earth, they won't be competing for an NBA championship. So they need to go ahead and bottom out and try to get a top draft pick. First things first, trade Terry Rozier. He's a streaky scorer who's better suited coming off the bench for a contender than being a team's main option on offense. But here in Charlotte, that's what he is. Also time to try to go ahead and trade Gordon Hayward, who is exactly as exciting of a piece as you would expect a white guy from Indiana named Gordon Hayward to be. He and his wife are team MAGA, and he probably not so coincidentally scored his career high on January 6, 2021. So you basically already know what you're getting with LaMelo Ball and PJ Washington, but it's time to see what you have in all these other young guys you've drafted and see if they can develop with more playing time. So blowing up the roster is going to help you do that. They're also severely lacking in a strong veteran presence. The guys who have played the longest are the aforementioned Gordon Hayward and Miles Plumley. Something tells me that the young guys aren't going to them for guidance. This is going to be particularly important for LaMelo. LaMelo has the skills of a star and the fame of a star after going through the big baller brand hype machine, but he's just completely unserious right now. I mean, just close your eyes and picture LaMelo leading a team on a deep playoff run. You can't. He just seems woefully immature. And that's to be expected for a kid who's just turned 21, but you got to give him some guidance to make sure he can maximize his on-court skills that saw him averaging 20 points, 7 rebounds, and 8 assists last year. Another reason they're not very good is Michael Jordan. He's the GOAT on the court, but he's been awful at putting together teams. It's hard to believe in them as long as he's in charge, particularly since he's so hostile to criticism that would help him out. I'm probably banned from Hornets games just for saying this. But is there hope? Well, I mean, they do have a lot of young talent that could be something. LaMelo obviously is an incredible talent. And we haven't seen enough of guys like Kai Jones and James Booknight to be sure they suck yet. And they thought enough of Mark Williams to trade Jalen Duran for him on draft night, although I'm not sure that this is a great sign for Williams based on what the other picks have looked like. And they still have that great color scheme. I mean, y'all remember the starter jackets. So overall, I badly want to like this team, not only for the color scheme, but also they're just a short drive away. I don't know what it is about Charlotte, though, but they remind me a lot of the Panthers. Vegas has set the over-under at 36 and a half wins, which sounds about right because they'll be bad enough where you wouldn't want to watch them, but not bad enough to actually draft a superstar. They'll probably go over that and win 38 games just to make sure they have the worst possible lottery pick so they just cannot draft anybody who's good. All right, moving on to the Portland Trailblazers. They were 27 and 55 last year, just truly terrible. Why are they going to be bad again this year? Well, for starters, outside of Damian Lillard, this whole team is a mirage. Nurkic, Justice Winslow, Jeremy Grant, on and on and on. This is a team of guys who have looked like they could be something or maybe like they were the poor man's version of another player, but instead they turned out to be just trash. And to make matters worse... Dame missed most of last season due to injury, and he's at that age where point guards start to fall off. And even if he's healthy, I think his loyalty to Portland after carrying the franchise all this time is running low, and I wouldn't be shocked to see him try to force a move in the middle of the season. But is there any hope? 
Well, I mean, if Dame is Dame, he can make up for a lot of issues, obviously. And even the guys I mentioned, like Nurk and Jeremy Grant, have qualities that can absolutely contribute to a winning basketball team. And one good thing about Dame's injury and the C.J. McCollum trade is it allowed Anthony Simmons to finally develop into a younger version of C.J. Add in the free agent signing of all-world defender Gary Payton II, and it's not hard to envision them sneaking into the play-in tournament and even making the playoffs. None of that will happen, though. It's all part of that mirage I was talking about. As far as this season's concerned, Vegas has set their over-under at 39.5 wins. That's a major improvement over last year. I do think they improve, but this isn't a 40-win team, and it's even worse if Dame forces his way out like I think. Either way, I think like mid-30s is going to be the ceiling for them. All right, moving on to the Sacramento Kings. They were 30-52 and 52 last year. They're going to stink again this year, but why? This team is a great example of how billionaires think that because they're good at making money, they're good at everything. Hey, Elon. Owner Vivek Renadive never touched a basketball until coaching his daughter's 12 and under team. They were really good. He had billions of dollars. So here we are. One of his incredibly innovative ideas was he wanted to leave a player on offense the entire game playing four and five on defense because this worked well when coaching his daughter's team. Now, this wouldn't work in the NBA, but I say go for it. Speaking of bad ideas, they have been terrible at drafting. They have passed up on Zach Levine, Jamal Murray, Devin Booker, Luka Doncic, and Trey Young. Their good draft picks have all been point guards, so they traded the one who had the most potential and wanted to be there the most. This team is just a mess. Okay, but is there any hope? Well, they finally moved on from Buddy Heald and Marvin Bagley last year, so that's something. They also brought in some shooting in the form of Malik Monk and Kevin Herter. And there's some hope that De'Aaron Fox can get back to normal now that he doesn't have to split reps with Tyrese Halliburton. Also, I'm a big fan of DeMontis Sabonis' game. Overall, though, meh. Vegas thinks they might improve a little bit and set the over-under at 33.5 wins. I'd take the over slightly, but I do think they are headed in the right direction. And Renardive might be learning that he needs to hire people who know what they're doing and get out of the way. All right, next up, we have the Utah Jazz. Now, they were 49-33 and 33 last year, which is great, but they stink now. Why? Well, because they blew this whole thing up. I mean, who is even left here? Is it just Mike Conley Jr.? Oh, and I guess Jordan Clarkson, who's about to shoot until his arm falls off. They should still sell out every home game, though, after drafting Walker Kessler and trading for Kelly Olenek and signing Cody Zeller. So why is there hope? Well, there's not a ton of it right now, but I guess you can hope that Danny Ainge keeps fleecing teams like he did the Timberwolves in the Rudy Gobert trade, and he's led rebuilds before, so that's something. I mean, it's a little concerning that he seems to like the idea of owning every first-round draft pick more than actually using them, but hinging all your hopes on a front office executive seems more fun than just about anything else you can do in Utah. And shut up about hiking. It's a made-up concept. You are just walking, except you're in the woods. All right, so what can you expect from them this season? Well, Vegas has set the over-under at 24 and a half wins, which feels high after realizing they now have Taylor Horton Tucker. What an infuriating player. He cannot shoot, he cannot finish at the rim, and he has a low basketball IQ. Good luck with him. On the bright side, Taylor feels like a Utah name. All right, let's move on to the Motor City and the Detroit Pistons, who were 23 and 59 last year. Truly terrible. They're going to be terrible again this year, but why? Well, they've been very bad in every imaginable way since they blew up the Chauncey Billups, Rip Hamilton, Rasheed Wallace, Ben Wallace team. They've made dumb trades, awful signings, and terrible draft choices. They haven't developed their players well, and they've had terrible luck with injuries. Did Ron Artest curse this organization for their role in the malice at the palace? But is there hope, though? Well, maybe there's not a curse. Also, I wasn't very high on Cade Cunningham when he was coming out of college, but he proved me wrong and he had a very good rookie season last year. He still has to improve as a shooter, but he looks like he could be a very good piece for a playoff team one day. Now, I am high on their rookies this year, Jaden Ivey and Jalen Duran. Ivey has legitimate superstar potential and he reminds me of Dwayne Wade, who I hate but was a very good player. Duran is 6'10", incredibly athletic. He's only 18 years old and already incredible on defense. This is the most hope I've had for the Pistons since I could legally drink. Okay, so what can you expect from them this year? Well, when your most talented players are this young and inexperienced, you're going to have a rough season, so I hope you can legally drink as well. They'll be better than last year's 23-win team, but I still think they come in under the over-under that Vegas has set for them, which is 29.5 wins. 
Okay, let's head on down to Disney World and talk about the Orlando Magic, who were 22 and 60 last year, truly atrocious, and they're going to be truly atrocious again this year. But why? Well, it's just a habit by now. They finished above 500 once in the 10 seasons since Dwight Howard left. They are among the best at being awful. It looked like they might be on the come up not too long ago, but they had some high draft picks not pan out. So they've completely bottomed out again, allowing them to have some more high draft picks that probably won't work out. They're very good at drafting guys who are great college players without considering that this is the NBA. Cole Anthony, aka Austin Rivers 2.0, Jalen Suggs, and Paolo Bancaro would be a fantastic team if they were trying to win a national championship. However, they each have flaws that will limit how good they're going to be at this level. But is there any hope? Well, I mean, if they're terrible again, which they will be, they're going to get another high draft pick, and maybe that guy won't be terrible. Okay, so what are we looking at this year? Well, if every young player on their roster reaches their potential, this is going to be a contender for the eighth seed in the East in five years. In this year, this will be an improved team simply because it's hard to win fewer than 22 games. Vegas agrees, and they've set their over-under for them at 26 and a half. I think they shock the world and win 29 games. All right, now it's time to talk about my childhood favorite team, the Houston Rockets. They were 20 and 62 last year. Eight-year-old me would be devastated. They're going to suck again this year, but why? All right, so last year, their roster was full of guys who either had major flaws in their games, in their personalities, or a combination of both. This year, they've shifted to having guys who either have major flaws in their games, are super young, or a combination of both. And then they have Kevin Porter Jr., who has major flaws in his game, in his personality, and is super young. Okay, surprisingly, this team does have hope, though, because anytime you have youth, you have potential. Jalen Green flashed his way sooner than they were thinking last year. Rookie Jabari Smith Jr. has loads of it. And even the aforementioned Kevin Porter Jr. has shown signs of being a decent piece when his head's on straight. All right, as far as this season's concerned, they're going to be bad again. And they're probably going to be bad the next three years. They did bottom out last year, in my opinion, because how do you win fewer than 20 games? Feels like they get to 25 this year, which would be over the 23 and a half wins that Vegas has set for them. All right, you can't talk about bad teams without talking about the Oklahoma City Thunder. They were 24 and 58 last year, and they're going to be bad again this year. Why? Well, they're terrible because they want to put together a team of seven footers who look exactly like Jack Skellington. At least that's my theory. They acquired seven foot, 190 pound Alex Pokashevsky a couple years ago, and just when you thought nobody could be taller or skinnier, they drafted Chet Holmgren this year, and he's pretty close. Now, unfortunately, Chet is out for the season with a foot injury, but that's okay because they have their sights set on Victor Winbenyama, who would be the tallest and the skinniest and the most talented of the group. They've gone all in on tanking and rebuilding since that's how they built the Thunder teams that were always one of the best in the Western Conference. So is there hope? I mean, yeah, because they're doing exactly what they want to do by getting high draft picks either by losing or trading for them. And like I said, they've been here before and it worked out. And they actually do have a decent amount of young talent like Shai Gilgis Alexander, who is already proven, as well as some other guys who just need some time to develop. Add in another generational talent from the top of the draft the next year or two, and it's just a matter of time before it works out. Also, friend of the show Danny Foxworth is a Thunder fan. He seems pretty happy, so I trust his judgment. Now, as far as this season is concerned, Vegas is thinking more of the same and has set the over-under at 23 and a half wins, but I think they're going to try to get under that, and I think they're going to succeed. So congratulations to you Thunder fans, and I hope the lottery balls fall in your favor. All right, it's hard to believe it, but we've come to the very last team in the preview, the San Antonio Spurs. They were 34-48 and 48 last year, which wasn't too bad, but they're going to be awful this year. Why? All right, well, if you've paid any attention to the NBA in the past 30 years, you realize how weird it is for them to be so bad. And with Coach Greg Popovich still here, I'd have to imagine it's all by design. And oh man, are they designed to be bad. This is just a roster of guys who badly need to be developed or go to Europe. However, there is a lot of hope though, because if you've paid any attention to the NBA in the past 30 years, you also know that this is the organization that you trust the most to develop players. And you're already seeing results with Keldon Johnson. All right, my official Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silver's theory is that Coach Pop wants to leave the organization on the path to success, and that involves bottoming out and drafting a generational talent. He's done this before, way back when David Robinson missed most of the 96-97 season, and they drafted Tim Duncan. 
I think they're gunning for the aforementioned Victor Wimbanyama and are working on developing a solid supporting cast to put around him. So overall this year, Vegas has set their over under at 22 and a half games, and it's hard to see them coming in over that, especially since I don't think they want to. And if I'm a Spurs fan, I'm actively rooting against them all year so that I can enjoy the next decade. Oh, oh man, I cannot believe I finished this. This about killed me, but I hope you enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun, despite how hard it was to put together. I'm excited for the NBA season. I know you are now because you're welcome. So thank you for listening. Continue to like, subscribe, rate, review, and share. And I will catch you next week.